Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. When that actor that was better than you or better looking than you, or more appropriate than you, gets another job because they're better looking, better and more, and more <laughs> appropriate, then they go, oh God, we've got two weeks to cast this thing, we better go to Paul Bentley. <laughs> you know? Listeners, welcome. I hope you are hanging in there and doing okay. At this, the somehow only second week of 2021. I am your host, Jack. I am here to maybe uh, provide a little bit of a reprieve from the world and um, everything going on in it. If you've come to listen to this podcast to hear inspiration and advice and nitty gritty on camera process, actorly craft stuff that really maybe only actors can understand, but non-actors can also get a lot out of, then this Paul Bettany interview is going to be right up your alley. I had such fun talking to Paul and then again just now putting this episode together. It's a really, really good one. In today's episode description and the article that goes with this episode, I will be linking to a backstage feature we have on how to get cast in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Paul Bettany is, of course, a character actor who's appeared in lots of different films, but is probably best known as Vision in the Marvel Cinematic Universe in so many Avengers movies. And fun fact, of course, many people know this, but uh, he appeared as just a voice in the initial mo- in the initial Marvel movies, in the Iron Man movies, and was then in Age of Ultron, I believe. Um, I believe, I know for a fact. He was then cast as a full-fledged character with crazy colored skin and armor and everything. So um, he speaks a little bit about that because WandaVision, the new Disney Plus series starring Paul Bettany as Vision and Elizabeth Olsen as Wanda in the WandaVision, premieres this week. And it's the first Disney Plus Marvel series and everyone's really excited about it. And the other uh, editorial piece that I will be linking to in today's episode description is our TV to come column, which drops on Backstage.com once a month, pointing readers, specifically actors, in the direction of the TV performances and uh, shows that you can't miss. For January 2021, we, of course, singled out WandaVision. So um, speaking of Backstage, those of you receiving Backstage print subscriptions are no doubt seeing some truly spectacular covers just to rattle off a couple names of our recent backstage cover stars, Kingsley Benadir, uh, Vanessa Kirby, Steve McQueen, the great director, Steve McQueen, and this week, Michelle freakin Pfeiffer. So, and that's kind of just the beginning. So stay tuned, subscribers to Backstage. Uh, those of you who are not even subscribed but would like to check out these stories, they are available on Backstage.com. I will be providing updates going forward, especially with our increased amount of episodes at this point in awards season, with everything going on at Backstage, you guys can expect some really fun interviews, fun content to consume beyond these interviews. Keep staying tuned after each of these podcast interviews to hear from our casting insider, Christine mckenna Torella. And that's about it. Let's take a quick break and then get to this phenomenal interview with Paul Bettany. Paul, if you are listening, thank you so much for joining us. This podcast is, of course, brought to you, listeners, by Backstage. Listen, aside from all the great inspiration and tips and all of that stuff we offer for free, like this amazing podcast, Backstage also gives you access to incredible casting calls all over the world. That is why it's the world's number one casting platform. If you're curious or if you're an actor yourself and you really want to jumpstart your career and you're ready to take the advice and the inspiration you've heard here in this very episode and use it... 
Go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code ENVELOPE, E-N-V-E-L-O-P-E. That's, again, 30 days completely free to try Backstage, where you can make a profile, upload a headshot, upload a reel, start browsing the casting notices, and start applying to jobs, because who knows, maybe one day, I'll be interviewing you. Again, that's backstage.com slash subscribe, and enter the code ENVELOPE. Paul Bettany gives compelling screen performances in the widest possible range of roles, from his breakout in Gangster No. 1 and A Knight's Tale, to A Beautiful Mind, Master and Commander, Dogville, Wimbledon, The Da Vinci Code, and more. Trained at the Drama Center in his native London, Paul has plenty of audition and character-building advice for fellow actors. He recently played the title role in Alan Ball's Uncle Frank from Amazon Studios, and leads the new Disney Plus series WandaVision, reprising his Marvel movie role as Vision. Here is Paul Bettany. Hello, Paul. Hi, Jack. How's everything going? Uh, it's going tickety-boo. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> so it's all right. Yeah, everything's all right. 2020 is a, a wild year, but, um, but you're yeah, hanging in I'm so I'm so ready to kick 2020 in the balls, to oh, be yeah. honest with you. I just, I can't wait for New Year's Eve. I, I've always sort of, I've always sort of loathed New Year's Eve, and I find myself oh. longing, just longing for it. I, I just, I can't wait. Absolutely. Did you see Rudolph Giuliani today with the, um, today, the makeup? No. Oh, it's amazing. It's like Death in Venice. There is just shoe polish dripping down his face from his hairline. What is happening with him? It's, and with it's really, it's, but I'm actually going to show it to you. I know we should. He's be actually, at this point, he, he is a scripted character. It feels like he can't possibly be real. I mean, it's crazy, right? It look, feels look. Like Paul Bettany should be playing him in a movie. Oh, it's a line. It's a line it's of, a black of hair line. dye. Something's gone terribly wrong there. <laughs> I feel like it's it's fun to talk about um, characters like that with, with someone like you who understands the human psyche so well and has played... I mean, I don't think you should play Rudy Giuliani, but like you've played villains, you've played psychopaths, you've played normal people. Like this podcast is, we're, we're very interested in the acting craft and craft and career advice. So I might ask you for your full, you know, artistic process if you're willing to go there. Yes. I mean, of course, um, the thing about acting mm -hmm. is it's a lot like sex in that it's really fun to do, but kind of embarrassing to talk about afterwards. Oh, sure. Okay. But, sure. but I can, I, uh, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm, we're, we're going to talk about it. Great. Good. Awesome. Okay. So take me back to the very beginning. Can I just ask you like, why, why acting? You came from a family of artists and performers, correct? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. My, my, um, my grandmother was um, was a singer she, she, in, in musical theater and light operetta um, and my um, on my mother's side and my father, my grandfather on my mother's you know the, the, her husband was actually f a New Yorker and he was Frank Lesser's um, pianist and then my my, my my father was a, a dancer in the Royal Ballet and then an actor. So, mm -hmm. and, and my mother was a, a singer uh, too. So yeah, I'm, uh, lots of lots of lots of that. But weirdly, it didn't feel like that because when I grew up, as I was growing up, my my mother was a secretary in a travel agency and my father was oh, a okay. teacher. So ah. it mostly didn't feel uh, like that. See, that's interesting because it's it's always fascinating to hear like if and when an actor at a young age realizes that acting is not just fun or something they want to do, but that it's a career. Did you always know mm. that it was a viable life path? <laughs> viable, no. quote unquote. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, it was actually my, um, I wanted to be a guitar player and okay. I just, 
um, and I wanted to um, be a singer songwriter. Mm. Uh, and then I, what I realized was I hated playing my own songs in front of other people, oh. and which is obviously a huge stumbling block, block to a, a, a major <laughs> recording career. Um, so I hated doing that, and and, and acting allowed me um, some uh, buffer between uh, me and the audience where the audience can the audience can assume that I'm like that person but they sure they don't actually know whereas if you're like my 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 heroes like John Lennon and you've written a song um, that says mother you had me but I never had you mm. then everybody knows everything about you <laughs> you know yeah. I, 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 I I kind of I kind of enjoy the um, the mystery. You, it, Interesting. I might be like that. I might not. You don't know. Sure. So that, um, that's so interesting to hear because I, I think especially actors have have talked about how it, you really are just using you and your instrument, and so it is your vulnerability. But you're right. There are forms of art that are far more soul bearing, including like, especially if it's music that you yourself have written. Yes, and I I, I think that. I think that it's also true of acting. I, I know actors that are brilliant who who just pull it down from the ether. Um, mm. You know, the, it's just um, it's just uh, 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 play, play acting, and it's amazing. And I'm not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not, I'm not good enough to do that, so it takes me a long time to. Uh, it takes me a long time to figure it out, and um, mm. and I have to. I have to really get invested to be any um, okay. any good at it. <laughs> <laughs> and when you say invested, you mean invested in kind of each role, each character. Yeah, I think especially as I as I get older, I, mm. I think. Um, mm. It feels um, uh, sometimes I feel uh, as you, well. You bruise easier, you know, as you get older, and, mm. and um, you don't bounce back as quickly. You know, uh, mm. it's the same thing with like physical exercise. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, and so you know, if you find yourself like I just uh, the the movie that is coming out is called Uncle Frank, and there's a scene. Mm-hmm where I'm at a, a, a great, it's great, it's a great side scene and it's very emotional. And um, I'm just telling you, I used to bounce back quicker from those scenes. So oh, you, okay. you, have a, you have a real, um, it's a real decision to go in there and pick the scab again. If you're, mm. unless you're somebody that can just uh, do it and is really, you know, gifted like that. And I just, um, I'm not, I'm not that person. It just depends on the yeah on the individual actor's process. I think so. Yeah, I heard that uh, in that scene you were you were basically sent home after after one or two um, takes. <laughs> yeah, we well, I was fortunate as an actor, and you to to have a really empathetic director, mm-hmm. and and um, I came on set. They had set up a big wide shot because the 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 light was so beautiful, and you want to capture all of that stuff in the wide when when the light is perfect, and because you can control it more in close ups um, uh, with reflectables and lights and things like that that you can't do in a, in a wide shot so much. And um, the the DP had set all of that up, and then I, I walked on set, and Alan Ball could see that I was ready to shoot i didn't need to say anything and he mm. uh, just said scrap that and put a cat let's get get the close-up shot so we shot the close-ups and then the mids and then we backed out and backed out to a wide shot and then uh we, i oh, had other sh- scenes to shoot that day but he mercifully uh oh. sent me home um uh so yeah that that that's true and i think that that you know my process is really different from film to film um mm. but when it's stuff like that mm. when it's emotional stuff i am at a loss to just make it up so then gotcha i will find myself with um personal objects that i've kept with me all my life wow. from the, that uh take me back to a place mm. and um it's not very comfortable. It's a very it's a, it's a, it's a nice thing to be able to do something creative with all of those 
feelings that were bad, but um, it's mm. it's a uh, it, it's it's not a very comfortable place. And like I say, there's something different about doing that at twenty than doing it at fifty. Totally. That's so interesting. Yeah, that it was maybe easier for you to to do an emotional tick like that and then do twenty more when you were younger. Well, uh, yeah. I, well, well, more more that it. I think the m- mental health uh, aspect of it is different now, I think, than it y- used, used to be. You know, you're supposed to be sort of growing up and calcifying and, 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 <laughs> and, and mm. it, you know, some people talk about it like it's therapy and it's really not. It's, it, you know, therapy is about sort of somehow understanding yourself and healing wounds. Yes. And this is about some sort of... Um, methodology that I was taught at school about keeping wounds fresh. Wow. <laughs> and, okay. Uh, you know, at drama school. And that is, um, that, you know, I'm just uh, not sure. I'm not sure how uh, healthy that is as, um, as, as you get older, you know? Okay. And so I, so, but what's interesting about it is it really makes you pick and choose your work. Oh, okay. Yeah. That is interesting. Cause I was going to ask, like it was drama center London where you, where you, Yes. Is that the foundation of your studies? So what has endured from that? Like, what would you say are you still using from that training? Oh, so much. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I mean, I used to think that I had abandoned it all, but it's just not true. I mean, I think that all of this stuff is really useful. Um, having, a, having a method or having a, a system or whatever you want to call it. Um, sure is really useful if your imagination is failing you and it can Mm. you know sometimes i mean this is i was talking about this actually just recently and i think it's really in the old days when i started to make a movie like this we would have had eight to ten weeks Mm. and now we have five i see okay and the wonderful thing about film acting as opposed to um in my opinion as opposed to uh theater acting it's Mm -hmm. it's theater you're working towards some sort of uh performance and you need to understand if something happens that's good and you need to be able to analyze and figure out what triggered that thing for you and so that you can repeat it Mm -hmm. right night after night it doesn't matter in film and the idea that you have any control over some sort of performance is gotcha. is naive because mm-hmm. your your director and your editor is going totally. to just make those sorts of decisions. Mm-hmm. So so at that point, what you do have is this wonderful um, freedom to that you are never you never out of rehearsal. You're always you're always in a rehearsal, and you can do anything, and they can cut it out, and and you can be bad and you can be indulgent and they can cut it out and you can make mistakes and mistakes are amazing. Um, Mm. so, so, so that for me is the difference, but that takes time. You need time to make mistakes. So the wonderful thing about, about film acting is sort of being taken away by lessening the amount of time that you have to make mistakes. Right. So, and then the pressure of like, well, I don't have to get it right now, but I do have to get it right within the next couple of hours because we have to move on because we, yeah. are, you know, this micro budget movie and and, yeah. and 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 all of that and okay. pressure like that can really get in the way of you being able to access the okay. things, the very things that you needed to um, to, to try and access. So, mm. so I think because re- I think relaxation is absolutely everything. Um, well, I mean, it's oh yeah. I mean, yeah. It's what I no- what I notice in the actors that really move me is their uh, is their relaxation. If you're tense and you're frightened, yeah. you, you 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 tend to worry about doing something mm-hmm. in front of a camera rather than being um, being open to the to, yes. to to the thing your partner's doing. And like you say, to almost to the mistakes, to get you to a point where you are, you've done enough of the work to be in character enough to be able to almost riff, especially opposite other people. 
Make, making mistakes. Um, Lars von Trier, he mm -hmm. made up the von, by the way. Um, oh, he, he's actually his, his name is actually Lars Trier. He he added von himself. <laughs> I uh, didn't know that. Which is so perfect. Um, he he had this brilliant. He had this sign that just said, "Please make mistakes." And um, okay, cool. And I think that that is that that is mm -hmm. great advice. I mean, funnily enough, it was Stellan Skarsgård. I, I'm I'm passing this off as like my own opinion, um, sure. but Stellan Skarsgård <laughs> was the person that told me, um, but was, was really made it clear to me that that um, film acting is is you never you're never not in a rehearsal, and that that's is amazing. one and that's and that's wonderful. And once you once you accept it and you really believe it, it's really freeing because you can do anything in rehearsal. Nobody's gonna. Who knows? Yeah. You know, it's probably going to be on the cutting room floor. So just, totally. just have fun. The point is to not try to encapsulate some perfect final product that you are building towards for each moment of each scene. It's not possible, you can't. right? And as you say, they'll, they'll cut it out. It. They'll reorder it. They're going to reorder your. I've never been in a movie where all of the scenes are in the same order they were in the script. So your yeah. idea of having yeah. some. Uh, you know, journey is going to be changed the moment. And, and by the way, I know this because I directed one movie. I, I, I would uh, yes, not call myself a director, but I directed one movie and it is terrifying directing. It's also the greatest <laughs> job ever, but you will do whatever you need to do to make yourself look better. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so you will, you will destroy an actor's uh, um, uh, plans to make yourself look better as a director if you think you can do it so they, they will do it so so you might as well you might as well relinquish um, and control because you really it's really an illusion yes and you're saying this is especially for film and TV like I really appreciate this distinction of theater is something you build towards because it's rehearsal and then performance. Yes, and the director's not on stage. Yeah, and the film is, it's all about this idea of, um, we've heard it a lot recently on this podcast, actually, where like confidence is sort of touted as being the most important quality, but it's really, it's more like relaxation and it's more like the ability to surrender to the process. Oh, yeah, I, I've never been confident. I've, uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> no, it's true. I've uh -huh. never, um, my it, it it's absolutely a surrender is is the mm. well i guess i'm f***ing here i really f I, I might be frightened yeah uh, but i'm still gonna be here and all i can do is get in my own way um, um yeah which is uh, gonna by, happen <laughs> by my terror uh so i might as well let go of it and just right. and just be be abandoned you know, just abandon, uh, and, um, and 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 that's the quality that I, I I and I'm not saying that I achieve it. By the way, I'm not this saying that goal. I achieve that. It, it's um, it's a, it's a, it's a goal. Forget about your own face. Think about your partners. Um, mm. That is another thing that I'm passing off as my own advice. But actually, it was Van Cassell. Okay. Told, he, and he was it, it, it was another great bit of advice that I got from an actor who said forget about your own face uh, mm. when the camera's on you mm -hmm. to be to forget about this and be be uh, um, and just simple things I mm. want to see them I want to see them smile I want to see them look terrified whatever it is and work towards seeing that on their face and just and, and try and get out your own uh, skin because otherwise you totally. start thinking, is this, how am I looking good here? I mean, can they, yeah. can they see my neck's going bad now as I get older? <laughs> right. I mean, you know, sure. I just... <laughs> There's plenty of insecurities in the life of an actor as it is. So yes. take it off your plate if you can. Yeah. Was yeah. this sort of transition, was it a transition from stage to, to, to screen acting? Like uh, Drama Center London must have prepared you mostly for theater. That's correct. Um, and it, it uh, I mean, I remember a criticism being leveled at it that was sort of preparing you rather idealistically for a, 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 a career that wouldn't exist. Um, but that doesn't oh, wow. matter. That, and that's probably true. But that mm -hmm. doesn't matter because you're going to learn everything you need to learn about 
being in some pop boiler crappy TV show in the first five minutes. And, okay. <laughs> you know, gotcha. I would much rather be prepared for um, uh, a, th- a great, great plays that, mm. uh, and a career that might not exist anymore um, mm. uh, than be prepared to, you know, learn to polish shitty dialogue on some, sure. you know, commercials or yeah certain tv yes projects. yeah I, 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 yeah exactly um and but was it a transition yes I've, i think of of course i mean i grew up loving film okay. and specifically american 1970s uh, okay. mm. um and early 80s film so mm. um so yes, whilst it was a transition, and I was all, I was so, I was, I was like a kid in a toy store. I, 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 I longed to be, I had longed to be on a film set, and then I was on one. And actually, I think I was on a film set before I was in the theatre professionally. That's yeah, that's true. I was on TV shows before, but then I, I spent, I spent a few years in the, in the, in the theatre, and um, uh, but. Yeah, I'm still. Uh, you're, you're always learning. I, le- you know, I learned off. Uh, uh, people keep asking me about Sof- Sophia uh, in Uncle Frank, Sophia Lillis, and like, mm-hmm. you know, you play her mentor. Did you mentor? And I just thought, <laughs> I've never been confident enough to mentor anybody. I don't, I don't think. Right. And I, and I, or whatever she says, she learned off us. I was learning off. I was so. You learned from she her. was so admirable the way mm. she was able to leave herself alone and and um you know so much of the story is really told through her rea- mm-hmm. uh, her reactions to our behavior and and she is in silence with these long silent soliloquies of her watching us and uh, uh, and her ability to just um to, to somehow not watch herself and just really um and listen uh, and really listen and mm. tell stories in silence is um is extraordinary i think i learned a lot from her yeah it's safe to say any any scene partners even bad ones maybe are a learning opportunity for you oh yes yeah every project e- probably every audition even, probably even bad ones yeah yes yeah. can i ask you about auditions <laughs> yes, you you absolutely can. I don't know whether I've got anything interesting to say about auditioning um, uh-huh. today because it seems so. It has changed. Awful. I mean, <laughs> just this yes. seems yes. so awful and cold and miserable. I I don't know how you. I don't know how you know actors. Yeah. Young actors ask me. That. Anyway, you had a question. Well, it's yeah. no, it's true. I mean, the auditioning has changed so much in the past few years, but I feel like especially in 2020, there are no in-person auditions. So self-taping really is the key. But as I understand it, your transition from uh, across the pond, essentially into the Hollywood system, was because of a self-tape that I believe was was sent to Ron Howard or someone was... Uh, Remind me who was advocating for you with your audition tape. You know what? That is, that's, that's true. That, um, it wasn't Ron Howard. I, it was, it, that's an interesting story. Yes. I, um, it was Brian Helgland. Uh-huh. And it was for A Knight's Tale. And prior to making After, A Knight's Tale, he'd been right. trying to make a film called Sin Eater, which he eventually made later. But... Um, I auditioned for it, and he found the the um, the uh, tape, and he, he found liked it. the tape. But yeah, I don't I don't <laughs> think it had been shown to me. He, he said, "Who? What was this?" Oh. And he put it in, and he went, "Oh, I like him." Okay. And um, and I mean, I think I was. I mean, I must have just been out of drums. I don't know, but he he flew over, and they just kept saying no, and then. Right. Then he he wrote me, and then he said, "Oh, I'm not going to make the movie," and I said, "Don't don't be silly." And he went, mm. "Don't flatter yourself. If I fold on you, I'm going to fold on everything." And then wow. he wrote a Knight's Tale, the part in a Knight's Tale of Jeffrey Chaucer for me, and then uh, I I did a I did a tape, 
and they showed it. He showed it to the studio, and they went, "Yeah, I don't get it." They um, still did. They still said no. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, and then he flew over and he um, he shot me with a with with a crew, and he took it all back, and they went, "Yeah, I don't get it." Wow. And then he flew me out. I mean, he he really. And then he flew me out, put me up in his own house, oh, wow. and he uh, he uh, brought me in, and the, and and I. I auditioned again for them, and then they went, "Yeah, I, we 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 just don't get it. We want oh so and so." And he went, "Well, then I'm not making the movie." And they went, F <laughs> because they had Heath Ledger at this point, and they really yes. wanted to make the movie. Uh -huh. And he had, and Brian had prior um, form for for just quitting a movie. And so they believed him. Yeah, he wasn't. Bluffing. So they believed him, and they let me. They let me be in the movie, mm -hmm. and. Um, and then what happened was he sent, I think, I think he sent footage of me in as Jeffrey Chaucer yeah. to Ron Howard. And okay. that's how that, that's how that happened. That's and that story. was, of course, the beginning of, it sounds like then Ron Howard was your, was another one of your champions where it was a beautiful mind. And then later, um, did you text that's him true. about a role in a Star Wars movie? Is that true? Yes, that's a hundred percent true. You sent him a very casual text saying you'd like to be in a Star Wars movie. Yes, well, it was kind of a little more cheeky than that. I, I, I asked him. I texted him. Um, have you ever spent long evenings wondering why you're not in the Star Wars movies? <laughs> I have, and <laughs> that's so mean. And he sent he sent me. LOL. Uh, I'll see what I can do, and that's. That is that that, yeah. That's that's true. <laughs> and they were having to reshoot the part, and they. I just got yeah. really lucky. They were having to reshoot the part because the actor that they um, they had shot wasn't available. He was on another project, and um, um, so I just I, I got really I just got really lucky. <laughs> yeah. Well, and ha have there been auditions recently? Have what what have been the recent projects that you've had to fight for? I um, auditioned for the Coen Brothers. It uh -huh. was the first time I had auditioned in in years, and I totally, totally blew it. Okay. I had. I was so nervous. I'm such a huge fan. Yeah. And I mm -hmm. was. Um, I was so anxious. I was like, sort of preternaturally anxious, and been up all night and mm -hmm. um, panicking about it, and. And I, 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 t I totally blew it because auditioning's hard. <laughs> yes. And would you say, is it a separate skill from acting? Do you prepare for an audition oh, differently than yeah. preparing for Oh, I don't know about, I don't know about that. I know that there are some people, there was a kid at my drama school called Jakob Anafelt. And Jakob Anafelt is among the greatest actors I've ever seen. Hmm. And he never got a job. Okay. Because he was so nervous and shy, and uh, I think it's really, it's really, I think auditioning is is um, it's horrifying for people yeah. who actually build a, um, a character. Really, I mean, he was one. He was he was an extraordinary right. actor, and um, I, I I don't think he ever he ever worked, and. Um, you know, I think it's really, I think that there are some people that are just incredibly charming in the room and uh, um, win the person, win the, win the people over. You know, that was always, <laughs> maybe I'm one of those people, but they're not very good. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, 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 um, I always thought, that, and this is why I really feel for actors having to do these subtypes because I always yeah. thought I am going to, I'm going to, win these people over in the room and I'm going to have them poised to want to say yes to me You're when, counting on uh, that. when yeah. uh, before I've read for it, you know, before I've even read, mm. I'm going to make them laugh. I'm going to make them want to spend yeah. eight weeks. You know, you. the, the yeah. leading actor might be a pain in the ass, but it's going to be fun to hang out with this person or yeah. whatever. You know, you know what I mean? And that's great advice too, actually, to try to try to do that for sure. Yeah, but I think it's really... But it's hard. <laughs> that, that's really true. I mean, the good news is you can curate the, the, uh, the choices that you give them, the takes that you give them, I guess. Um, sure. Uh, but, but... A tape. I don't know. 
I, I, I don't know that that, for me, that doesn't um, balance out being able to sort of sit there and look somebody in the eye and, and discuss the role. Sure. It's almost like that idea you were talking about of, of make sure your attention is on your, the person you are speaking to rather than your own face and your own expressions, that that's not yes. possible when you're doing a self-tape because you have no one to bounce off of. That's right. So it's more like... And, and if you are acting, if you are auditioning in front of the writer, mm. don't make shit up. Uh, this is oh. this is uh, this is advice from Alan Ball. He gave it to mm -hmm. young actors the other day uh, on this call we were on, mm. and he said, "If there, if you're gonna make up lines, if you're gonna improvise in front of the writer, you best be really, really good." Yeah, <laughs> and it, you know, so you don't do that. That's good. Um, and the other thing, the other thing I would say, my advice about. Um, auditioning is that I was always looking for what I could control in the situation. Okay. And I couldn't control whether somebody w with a bigger name was going to come in and want the role or, hmm. or somebody who was um, better looking um, or more appropriate or just frankly, more talented sure. was going to walk in. I couldn't control any of that, but the thing that I could control and could promise to be mm. is mm. the most prepared mm. person walking in. I'm dyslexic. Mm. I used to pretend to read this. I never have ever um, uh, sight read in an audition ever oh. um, uh, because of that. I would stay up all night and work on it and I couldn't promise to be the best actor that's going to walk through the door, but I would be um, the most prepared. So excellent advice. Yeah. Then when that actor that was better than you or better looking than you or more appropriate than you <laughs> gets another job because they're better looking, better and more <laughs> appropriate, then they go, oh, God, we've got two weeks to cast this thing. We better get a Paul Bentley. <laughs> you know, <and> they, <laughs> who was that guy that was really prepared? Be the best yeah. second choice for every job. Be, be the best <laughs> second choice. That's exactly right. Uh, you know, you that's can, great advice. No, that's, it's absolutely true. You make a career say, out of that. <laughs> yeah, well, make it make a career out of prepare out of um, it's, it's excellent advice. Focus on what you can control and be realistic about what you can control and what you cannot. I think that's right. You cannot control who's right for the role or who else is going to come in. Nope. That's right. <laughs> so focus on you. Yeah. That's excellent audition advice. I think that is audition advice for self-taping um, in person. If, if there are ever in-person auditions again, that's true for meetings with directors yes. and writers. Yeah, I you know that I I know actors I, that I I came up with who would um, who would just wing it and and mm -hmm. I know actors that would wing it and were brilliant and and got sure. the work and I know actors that would wing it and didn't and mm. they were always able to say to themselves well I didn't really work very hard on that so it wasn't me whereas I would prefer oh. I can take not getting the job. I can find a number of reasons why I didn't get the job that aren't gonna um, aren't gonna destroy me. Right. But what is eventually gonna destroy you is thinking I never quite tried hard enough. Yeah. So work hard enough so that that is not one of the reasons you didn't get the job. It was not on you. Don't stop. I wouldn't stop all night long. If I had days, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be out in the pub. I wouldn't be. I'd just be working on this one thing to make it look like hmm. I was better than I was. <laughs> and then sure. I would be. Work, I'd be working on the tube on the way to the. You know. I mean, just work, 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 work. Sure. So then, so then, let's say the next, maybe the de next phase of the different process is the having of the job and building a character. You have played so many different characters and in so many different genres. And I'm wondering, yeah. is there something you do every time? Does it really depend on the director, on the collaborators? Do you have a, do you yeah. have a similar process or are you like starting from scratch every time? Um, it's really, I can't quite figure out what it is. I don't know. There are some times where I'm uh, uh, definitely a little bit more shooting from the hip. And there are some times where I'm incredibly fastidious 
uh, like I was at, at, at drama school in, in clarifying objectives, super objectives, activities, even gotcha. um, breaking down my dialogue into different, um, uh, and even using, I did this really recently on the job, even using um, old Laban techniques that I learned at, 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 at drama school. Oh. But I, I, But sometimes not. And I often think that the thing that I do that is always the same mm. is that I look at it, I read the script, I figure out what, I, I think, I try to think about three outer characteristics and three inner characteristics. And then I think oh, cool. about which, if any of those, I, I have. Okay. Or, and, okay. That are similar to me. So how similar is the character in certain ways cool. to me? And then I don't need to work for those things. Um, right. And and then there might be other things that I that I do need to work for. And um, but all of this usually happens when um, your 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 imagination is just is just failing, and you really need. And that's why I was saying uh, having a system yeah. is a really is a really um, is a really good safety net to be yeah. to be prof to be a professional actor. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're not just getting you know lucky every now and again. You know, you can go in and go. I'm really really struggling. Yeah, and you have a you have a system in place to get there if if it's just not cl sure. clicking for you. And of course, there are some people just so preternaturally gifted that mm -hmm. they just don't need to do that. I mean, I don't think that Meryl Streep is sitting there trying to figure out. She, I think she's just she she has done made some Faustian pact with the devil yeah. and is just <laughs> the greatest actor there has ever been, and um, that ease uh, mm. of her acting is just extraordinary um yeah but if you're if if you're not Meryl Streep you know you might you might want to have a system <laughs> <laughs> it's true we we feel I feel like at this point it's a contractual obligation on this podcast to mention her at least once an episode because she well, is sort of the gold standard of 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 I think of what you're saying about this idea of surrendering and being able to fall back, she can always fall back on surrendering to the scene, to the character, to the circumstance. She is, she is just, she's my favorite actor that there has ever been. Oh, I mean. That's great. Ugh. I can't, you know, like, I, I love to look at some people's uh, work and you can see their work and you can see, you, you, you go, oh, that was so clever. That was such, I, I am, I'm lost at the moment she comes on screen. She is just you can't in, analyze. Yeah, she's entirely fleshed out and real to me, and I, I um, I am, I have to go back and rewatch the movie to think about what she's done. And sure. every time she she pulls a magic trick that just it's uh, that ease. Yeah, she's perfect. A Faustian pact. Yes, it's a Faustian pact <laughs> with the devil. It has to be. She went to the crossroads, man. Yeah. Nobody plays blues like Meryl Streep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do think that it's so funny that this is this year is when you have Uncle Frank and WandaVision because that right there illustrates th those must be two completely different processes. Uh, I love that. I love the nerdy. Um, what are three characteristics inside and outside? Because obviously, vision, physical characteristics. That's an example of someone who is not like you, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. And maybe Uncle Frank has a lot more. Maybe Frank has a lot more. Um, where do I? rise to meet this character? Where, where can I draw from my own life to play this person? Yes, I think that's true. And sometimes it's about, um, yeah, I mean, with, with, with uh, WandaVision, it was a, a delicious task of looking through all of those great performers like uh, Dick Van Dyke. You know, I mean, watching those Dick Van Dyke shows, you are, you're kind of blown away by the, by the skill And um, mm. the, the 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 amount of knowledge the guy can sing, he can dance, he can do you know, you know, pratfalls, he can mm. he can he but he and he can act and um, and it was lovely uh, being able to watch all of those shows and and uh, and, and and stuff um, and then moving through different genres, you know, the, you know, through Bewitched and. Um, You know, fr frankly, we, we, you know, even onto things like Malcolm in the Middle and all, all of those sorts of um, um, 
shows. But Uncle Frank, yeah, Uncle Frank was something different. And you, um, I guess when I'm talking about inner and outer characteristics, I mean, the most obvious thing is you could find you have, he has a, I'm, I'm just pulling this out of my ass. Uh, mm-hmm. He has an outer characteristic of confidence, mm-hmm. um, but his inner is insecure. And, okay. and, and, mm-hmm. and you can find characteristics that correlate and sort of re- resonate, I guess. I see. Um, that's kind of what I meant by that. Um, but The characteristics um, can be in conflict like that. They can contradict each other. A hundred percent and probably Wonderful. should. And they probably should. Okay. I think so. I think it's good to. I think. It, I think it's good to find because mm. I think that then they, you, 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 you make it, they make for more interesting characters. I think. Um, but I think finding a reason, a reason to do it, mm. is really good. Um, a reason. Okay. Uh, yeah, beyond financial remuneration or <laughs> or fame or something. Career um, advancement. Yeah career advancement or something sort of self, self-serving and venal uh, and, yeah. and, and, and narcissistic, which a lot of it is. But, you know, mm. placing yourself in somebody else's shoes and really trying to do some imaginative work on what that might be like is, is I think, um, it can, can be edifying. And, and um, you know, I, I had serious questions when, 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 when Alan sent me the script and what, why... Why do you want me to do it? And should I do it? And uh, mm. we talked a lot about his life. Um, and then we talked about mine. And I, I was I was raised by um, a closeted gay man um, who came out at 63 and had a 20-year relationship with a man called Andy who was undoubtedly the love of his life. And then when Andy died, uh, my father went back in the closet just before his death because he... I think because of religious dogma, he's a Catholic mm. and, and he really didn't believe he was going to get into heaven because it was a mortal sin. And so the, the, and the consequences of that are manifold. The consequences are he was never able to mourn the loss of the love of his life. Mm. Um, and when my father died, I was with him and in his pocket, I found a, a, a little glass vial of Andy's ashes. Oh, wow. And... Um, there are also consequences for the family, of course, because my father had a bunch of curated uh, anecdotes and stories that were supposed to sort of stand in the place of history. Uh, but of course, my mm. father had a secret history, sure. and they, 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 these these stories that were, I mean, stories are supposed to sort of bring you in, right? That these mm. stories were actually about keeping you at arm's length. And, mm. I, and the, you know, the consequence is that if you're holding a secret that big, mm. uh, is that people never really get to know you authentically. Mm. So I never really got to know my father. And my mother never really got to know her husband. And my brother never really got to know his father, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Mm. And, and so I found that a pretty good reason for me to do it for yeah. it, it, in order to go some way to imaginatively put myself in somebody's that has somebody's position that has a similar predicament and um and find a way of letting go of whatever resentments I'm, i might be sure. holding and imagining a different outcome for my father okay. where he got to live his, as his authentic self, and it was a really, wow. it was a really um, amazing uh, journey doing that. And, and there's, there's, there's a similar story for Alan Ball in that mm. his coming out to his mother did not go like that at all. <laughs> and and it was so it was a sort of putting right of certain things, and also it, it, it is a pretty um, fresh uh, thing for us to see is a story about two men who love each other and neither one of them has to die at the end of the movie. Yes, <laughs> that's always welcome. Yeah. You know, and so that felt, that felt, you know, and even though Aunt Butch at the end of the movie is, uh, she's not accepting of it. Mm. You know, she says, you're going to burn in hell. And he says, I know that's the best that you can do. This, she's still outside with him drinking iced mm. tea with the family afterwards because he's 
become his authentic self. So whether whether she accepts it or not is really a, a distant second to his being able to be authentic in front of his family. So that felt that that felt important to me, and it felt like a good enough reason to uh, exactly to sit in front of a grave and play acts being sad about. You well, know. exactly. I mean, that's really beautiful. And thank you for thank you for sharing those personal reasons, because I think that that really illustrates your point about you as an actor are not choosing. I mean, sometimes actors have to choose roles based on career. But in terms of whether, you know, whether or not to really go there with a character and really invest in the emotional aspects of the character, you do have to ask the simple question of why. Like, why do I want to do this? What is my way? Oh, of- yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And even if you're doing it for your career, and of course we all are, you know, I mean, that uh-huh. doesn't, you don't stop needing to, um, to take care of that, but you'd be, you, you would do well to find a, a reason to, to, to motivate you as a person, just as sure. a, just as a, as a student, you know, mm-hmm. as somebody like, what is going to drive me to do the work? Sure. Well, and our, I mean, earlier you said, I mean, you were sort of joking, but you said that um, this isn't therapy for you, that acting is a painful emotional process. But it sounds like in this case, at least, Uncle Frank was maybe an opportunity to, as you say, work through some things, you yourself. Um, uh, you, but, do, but that's that's sort of, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of different things, right? And it's mm-hmm. not, pay- I actually had the most amazing uh, time making this movie and I laugh uh, a lot and um alan and i have very similar senses a twisted senses of humor and it was uh, a lot of fun so i don't want to describe a, a, an experience that is just painful but on that day right. yes that was painful and there yeah. were a few painful days on that that job uh, but yes the, the, that is something that is something di- different i i question i question how healthy it is Mm. to i I don't know what what your process is or your listeners proceeds are i don't know how your processes are um but but um mine involves a lot of sense memory over things like that and taking myself back to a place that i am perpetually trying to keep fresh for the entertainment of others which is a weird thing to be doing at 50 it feels unseemly sometimes uh-huh. you think Picking the I scab. want to I really want to close this thing up in my life and yeah. why have I put so much energy into keeping it right. um, I'm not I'm not gonna <laughs> and keeping it painful it's why a little masochistic. have I done yeah. yeah what have I done that for <laughs> and and um but great work that yeah. is what results in that what what can result in great acting yeah but oh, well i don't know i mean uh, I, like i say i don't think meryl streep needs to do that i think she Maybe just not. has it she did that she did that deal with the devil and right. and 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 i've seen other actors that just wear that stuff so lightly and they're brilliant and i you know i i i don't, I don't care how anybody gets there even whether they're sticking you know um menthol in their eyes to make them cry if, oh, it, if sure. it's real it's a, it's a magic trick i don't i don't I, I don't care how they're doing it i just know that uh i just know that i'm not good enough to do it that way <laughs> and, and 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 um i i don't i don't say one way is better than the other i really don't believe that i'm just not good enough to do it that way and i do i do find myself <laughs> late at night when you finish the scene like that, and you're uh-huh. you're in your hotel room with a six pack of beer, going drinking it, to, and you're thinking like, was this really the wisest <laughs> yeah. way I could have spent my day? But um, <laughs> but nevertheless, you know what else am I going to do? Better sure. than digging ditches. Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. That's actually that's that's wonderful. Thank you. I have to let you go soon, but going off of the. Um, we asked this of everyone, what is one performance you think every actor should see and why? But maybe another way of putting that is what Meryl Streep performance should every actor see and why? Oh my goodness. There are, <laughs> I, I, I think that that is... Um, is there one that you find yourself studying a lot? 
Well, like I say, uh, my problem with Meryl Streep is she's yeah. a magician, you and can't I, it out. yeah, I, I can't figure it out, and yeah. I, and. And I was talking to that about when my friend, who is a a, a, a close hand magician, and he says uh-huh. there are about two magicians in the world that he literally he can't work out how the trick is done. Okay. Like most tricks, he knows where it's happened, and even if it's really uh, sophisticated, yeah. he knows he kind of knows how the trick is is performed. And, and and I can say that about actors, actors who are much better than me. I can, but I can still see mm. ah. I see what you're doing to, yeah. you know, uh, Mer- Meryl Streep, I've no idea. I've never been it's able to analyze her not once. So, uh, so I would say watch everything she, I mean, <laughs> everything. Um, <laughs> my favorite answer to that um, question. Oh my, this, you know, when, when being asked a question like that, you suddenly, your head is just full of all of these, <laughs> um, you know, extraordinary performances that you've watched over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, wow, I would say um, there is a uh, performance in a movie. He's also the director of the movie, and I'm gonna blank on his name. Mm. But um, it's in Burnt by the Sun. Who directs and stars in Burnt by the Sun? It's a it's a Russian movie, oh. and it is a it is a performance of such completeness. Yeah, who is you've got a who's gonna Google that for us? I can't. It's uh, Nikita Mikhalkov. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs> Nik- Nikita Mikhalkov. Is it Mikhalkov? Something like that. Yeah. Something like that. I love I love British people. Something like that. Um, yeah. Um, I'll have to add Nikita this to the Mikhalkov. List. Um, it, the movie is burnt by the sun. The movie is extraordinary, and the uh, and the performance is is mind blowing and mm. and it begins and you're in immediately it begins with uh his daughter and there's this moment where and it's it's at his actual daughter in real life and there's this moment where he picks okay. her up and swings her up with one arm onto his shoulders and you 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 buy everything going forward it's such oh. a real moment and the relationship between him and this kid and it is, you will cry your eyes out at the end of that movie. It's oh, wow. an extraordinarily powerful film. Excellent. That's an excellent, that's an excellent recommendation now that we, I'm adding it to the list. I, he sadly, as a director and person, became a huge acolyte of um, Vladimir Putin's. But oh. nevertheless, yes. that movie, <laughs> Burnt by the Sun, which is about the sort of, uh, the sun being the, 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 the revolution, is uh, is uh, it's an extraordinary performance. Oh my God! And another one. Here uh-huh. you go, Stellan Skarsgård. Yes. This is a deep cut. Stellan Skarsgård in the Simple Minded Murderer. Okay. And Stellan Skarsgård <laughs> does this thing in. And I, I I saw this movie. He was very young in this movie, and he does this thing in this movie that is so extraordinary. He plays. Um, he plays this, this uh, simple-minded stable hand and he lives in the stable with the animals and it's on a big um, estate of this massive mansion and the guy that owns the mansion is cruel and, and Stellan's um, sister runs away as a young, young kid mm. and she comes back, a famous actress, and she's with this guy and he sees her in the stable and she looks at him and he looks at her and he goes to speak and she shakes her head and says, you know, as if to say, don't give me away because she's changed her name. And she's, and, huh. and he does this thing where he just looked away and my heart broke, right? Wow. My, my heart broke. So I go to Stalin the next day. I, I said, mm-hmm. Stalin, I just watched that movie last night and you're extraordinary and you're only a kid. I mean, really, you were so young. And, wow. and you do this thing in the middle of the movie where, and I told him, and you look away and, and it, it just broke my heart how, how you didn't milk it for the camera. You, 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 I, I, it, it was so real and so honest. And I, I wish I could have done something like that in my life once as an actor. And he went, Paul. Here's the truth, is I didn't know what to do, and I was frightened the camera would see my face. So I turned my face away from oh the camera. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Happy accidents. How and perfect. that's full circle. Make mistakes, that man. That is absolutely full circle. <laughs> 
full circle in terms of um yeah ignore your own face make mistakes still in scars guards yeah wow <laughs> paul thank you so much i have to let you go soon do you have any parting words of um parting words of wisdom for our listeners is there anything maybe if you could go back in time anything you wish you'd known earlier in your career well you know i mean never eat fish on location okay. uh, from catering very very important advice I, I i i don't i don't know i feel like i've given a lot of it's very it's very unlike me to give advice by the way so this whole um uh, and to talk about acting this whole thing has been a, a revelation for me i didn't know i had so much advice <laughs> to give okay and I, yeah i would i would strongly advise people to ignore most of it because i was <laughs> it's the first time i've said it so it might not be true it might not be um, true so i take my advice with a pinch of salt that's my advice <laughs> Yeah, no, it's great. And my my words of wisdom are to take whatever <laughs> advice I've given during this podcast with a pinch of salt, and um, and don't eat the fish, and uh, take it easy on yourself and make mistakes, and um, that's about it. Beautiful, really. Thank you. It's really nice talking to you. So nice talking to you. This is so this is such a pleasure. Really good fun. Keep breaking legs, and and if and when you work with Meryl, I look forward to to watching. I would know what to <laughs> do. Clutching I'd your... be frozen. I would be frozen. Yeah. Oh. And now it's time to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. I will let her take it away. Hi guys, Christine McKenna Torella here. Last episode, we talked about how to deal with that disappointing audition, and I suggested a few things to employ during the audition itself. This week, Paul Bettany shared with us that even he, even now, he's gone into an audition and his nerves have got the best of him. So it truly does happen to everyone. Part two, what do you do when you've left that audition? So the first thing I'd say is unless you have a crystal ball, you really don't know how that audition went, right? You're guessing and you're reading energy and most likely being too hard on yourself. You know, I've had actors that are good friends of mine who have been in my audition space with, you know, the creative team, et cetera. And later on, they've asked me for feedback and they've been like, oh, I knew it was terrible. I knew I, I bombed it. And I'm like, what are you talking about? That's not the perception of it behind the casting table. So That's my first point, probably my most important. You really do not know how that audition went. Be kind to yourself, okay? Give yourself a break. Secondly, I suggest that you keep an audition log to help analyze and track your audition successes and challenges. It should be an Excel document or, you know, the equivalent with the audition date in one column, the type of audition in another, who it was for in that third column, what you did for them, what material you read, how you felt it went, and whether or not you got a call back or, or booked it or any other notes that you'd like to add. You, of course, of course, can customize that, but that's the basics of how you would keep an audition log. If you diligently fill this out post-audition, over time, you'll be able to use it to be a little more, I'd call it scientific, about what's going on in the audition room, what's working for you, and what challenges you might be experiencing with particular types of material, with particular people in the room, etc. A way to use this would be, you know, if you are a musical theater artist and you're using the same song for particular types of auditions and when you go over your audition log, you realize, oh wait, when I use this piece, I'm I'm not getting a callback. I'm not being seen again. Could it be that this isn't the right material for me? Do I need to reinvestigate that or get some feedback about where it is landing vocally for me, right? Like, so there, there's real ways in which you could add a lot of value to the work that you're doing in the audition room by keeping that log. It's super useful to be able to go back and identify patterns in your auditions. Sometimes you're going to leave the audition room and really want to be able to read again. And that's not always going to be possible. Of course, you can ask the casting team if they could see you again for a piece. 
that's going to be time dependent. That's going to be project dependent. So I can never say that that's something that's definitely going to happen. You can politely and professionally ask. But if the project has passed, if, if they are not going to see you again, you have to be brave enough to ask for the feedback. It's similar to that analysis of your audition log. You want to receive feedback from people that care, people that do this every day, and, and hopefully they're going to put it in in language that feels there's growth and opportunity to really learn from what they're saying to you. But those are kind of your two options when you've left the room and you really want to read again. It's a very common question that I get, like, if I mess up, will you see me again? And here is always my reply. One audition will not make or break your career, right? If you're running late or you're not right for the role, or if it's just you know, quote unquote, a bad audition, in all likelihood, the casting director will see you for something else. If it's a pattern, right? Like if if I'm always, if I'm trying to schedule you and you never turn up or, you know, if you, which is of course totally unheard of, I know no one listening here would do that, but I'm just saying, if I feel like your chemistry or your, your energy is off when you come into the audition room and that's like a pattern that starts to emerge, that might start making me a little bell go off my head about not bringing you into the audition room. But if you've just had a bad day, you're going to be seen again. Above all, let it go. You'll have lots of auditions in your career. You can't torture yourself over each and every one of them that doesn't go perfectly. Be kind to yourself. On to the casting highlights. Take a look under our film and documentary section. We have a high-paying documentary voiceover from Blackbird Productions. It's a nationwide search. They're flexible about recording in a studio or at home with professional equipment, um, you know, according to the COVID restrictions at the moment. They're casting a narrator for a new JFK documentary series based on a new biography that's coming out. Sounds super exciting. Details on the site. And then for my friends in Philly or outside Philly, there's a well-paid non-union shoot for an online promo for a wedding product seeking three male roles. They're going to be playing grooms. Details on the site for exactly what they're looking for. That shoot is at the end of January. There are, of course, many more casting calls to be found on Backstage.com. Take a look or listen back. I had a few other highlights earlier this week in Rashida Jones's episode. That's all from me. Break a leg in your upcoming auditions and have a beautiful, beautiful week. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.